Uh, we do have a Q&A session uh, in the latter half of this forum today, so please hold on to your questions until then. We will now like to introduce the three guest speakers uh, from uh, London to sh ex uh, share with us about the experience of London's uh, cultural program. And now uh, the order of, uh, uh, of their speech uh, is a little different. Uh, to uh, then what you have at hand. So the order would be uh, Ruth, uh, Mora, and then uh, Justine. The art director of uh, 20 London 20, uh, the London Cultural Olympiad and the curator of the London 2012 Festival. Uh, Ruth, uh, can you give us uh, your part, please? Um, thank you so much. And it is uh, a great honor to be here today. Uh, and a huge privilege to see so many people uh, here. Um, uh, first, may I congratulate um, all of you here for having this conversation now in 2014, uh, when you still have six years to go before your Olympics in 2020. Um, I would like to congratulate you also for the thinking you have already done uh, and for your commitment to put culture uh, back in the, in the wedding with sport for Tokyo 2020. Your plans already are impressive and I particularly congratulate you on your commitment to include young people and to encourage people to participate in art, not just to consume it. I was only appointed to the London 2012 Olympics in 2010. So what you will see from us today uh, uh, was put together very quickly. And the first lesson for you, uh, you have already followed, which is to start earlier. I have no doubt that you can produce a festival in 2020 that will be much, much better than London 2012, because you have got six years to dream and then to plan and deliver. I'm going to talk mainly about the climax of the Cultural Olympiad, because that is what I mostly worked on. And in the London 2012 Festival, the centre of our planning was commissioning artists to create a once-in-a-lifetime commission. What we said was that it is once-in-a-lifetime for most people the experience that the Olympic Games comes to your city and your country so that we would like artists to produce a once-in-a-lifetime piece of new work to match that once-in-a-lifetime experience. We commissioned artists in every art form, in visual arts, in the creative industries, film, in fashion, in comedy, in museums, and you will see just a few examples from me today. So if you do not see your art form, do not worry, it was there. So for most of the artists, we just said, be wonderful. Create something ambitious. Create something you have never thought you could achieve. But for a few, they wanted to know if they could relate to the themes of the Olympics. And we made two suggestions. One was the theme of Olympic peace. In ancient Greece, the all the states and countries that took part in the Olympics agreed that they would stop fighting each other. They would have a peace in the period before the Olympics and during the Olympics and afterwards to allow people to travel safely and enjoy the games. By the way, of course, in ancient Greece, they came to see the artists as well as the athletes because the Olympics began in ancient Greece as a celebration of art as well as sport. This commission is one of many where artists took the theme of peace. In this case, you see those little lights. They are tents, 
and in the tents is a sound installation of the greatest love poetry of the United Kingdom for people to wander freely through and be inspired by. This was actually commissioned with the Tourist Board of Northern Ireland because our festival, although it's called London 2012, it took place all over the United Kingdom, in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, in Wales, from the Shetland Islands near Norway down to the Scilly Islands near France. And the Northern Irish Tourist Board saw that there was a chance to tell the world about the beauty of the landscape of the beaches of Northern Ireland. For many people around the world, Northern Ireland is only a country that fought each other. But now it is at peace. So what more beautiful way to show the world than from an artistic project about peace on one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. This will be a theme we will all return to, that through our partnerships between artists and agencies in the UK, we could show and share with the world the images of the United Kingdom seen through the eyes of artists and encourage tourists to come and visit our beautiful country. The other theme that we chose from the Olympics is the theme of the Paralympics that shows you the achievements of disabled athletes. You think of their achievements and not of their disability. And as you have heard, we created a program unlimited to commission disabled artists and you will be following with this program for which again I thank you and congratulate you. Here are some more images from the unlimited program of commissions. It was very important for us that we encouraged young people and that in our program of arts, we invited artists from around the world who could relate to all of our communities and to potential friends across the world. And this was a project where, uh, with our partners, the broadcasters, the BBC, we did the largest concert of street music in the centre of London that had ever been seen, led by artists like Jay-Z, Rihanna, Florence uh, and others. As well as pop music though, it was important to um, celebrate work that had never before been seen. And this is one of many commissions where we created world premieres. This is by the classic composer Stockhausen, who wrote a series of operas, one for every day of the week. This is Wednesday. It has never been staged until the London 2012 festival. It was known to be unstageable, impossible to stage, because it had three camels, two choirs. He required the orchestra to be hung from the ceiling. Uh, and most dramatic of all, in the middle of this five-hour opera, he had a helicopter quartet with four real helicopters flying round the city in each helicopter, a member of a string quartet, all of them beamed live to the audience down below. We put on this opera in Birmingham, which is in the middle of uh, England. And for Birmingham, this brought the eyes of the world. It got coverage in the newspapers and on television in virtually every continent in the world. And for the people of Birmingham, they achieved the staging of an unstageable opera. We commissioned artists to look at famous landmarks, and you will hear more later about some of the landmarks in London. This is Hadrian's Wall, 77 miles long, built by a Roman emperor to stop the people of Scotland from invading England. It didn't work. But we commissioned artists from New York to create a digital piece where people from around the world could light up those balloons in different colors and send messages 
from one end of the wall to the other. Here is another example in a World Heritage Site, Stonehenge, an ancient site, maybe a temple, nobody knows. But because it is World Heritage, there are strict rules and you're not allowed to go near it normally and you're certainly not allowed to create a fire garden with an extraordinary group of French artists as we did here. This was truly a once in a lifetime experience for those who saw it. And again, it reminded the world of the beauty that is this tourist landmark Stonehenge. I'm passing over some more similar commissions but I should say that as well as asking artists to create large scale pieces, as you can see, in unusual places, places that did not belong to anybody, unlike uh, traditional arts venues, these beaches, these landmarks are accessible and known to everyone. We also thought it important to make sure that much of our program was free. 80% of our program in the London 2012 Festival was free of charge. And this too encouraged new audiences to come. And it encouraged audiences to risk. This is not a point I have made before in the seminar, so I wish to stress this. When you invite an audience, to come and see a new piece of work. Sometimes audiences are afraid because they have to pay and they do not know what they will see because it is new. If you invite audiences to see a piece of work for free, the audience is more generous. They will come and they will share in the creation of a new piece of art. And this way, your risk gets its reward of large audiences. And that's very important when you commission new work. This is a piece in a zoo, a piece about animals, which for the first time in its life, it's a story of Noah's flood, an ancient story, uh, very appropriate about rain for 40 days. The participation of young people, as I have said, was central to the work of the festival. And it was important for us to give those young people a once-in-a-lifetime chance. This is the famous conductor, Gustavo Dudamel. Some of you will know him. He came from Venezuela, where he developed his music skills through an education program in the favelas, the very poor town in uh, Venezuela. Um, his program involved young people learning musical instruments and because they did not have proper homes, they all practiced together in the community. So they learnt to work as a team as well as to play their instruments. And in Scotland, in a, in a similarly uh, disadvantaged town, they have followed the same system it's called The System. And their hero was Gustavo Dudamel, but they had never met him because he is now the principal conductor in Los Angeles. So we brought him and his 220-person orchestra to work with these young people in Scotland. And all of them together created the concert that opened the London 2012 Festival. We built a special outdoor concert hall for them and the concert was broadcast around the world. Really a once in a lifetime experience. Here again is a project created by 34,000 young people working with the Tate Museum, the Tate Gallery, our greatest contemporary gallery, and with the artists Ardman who created Wallace and Gromit, 
the cartoon that won an Oscar. They taught the children how to do animation. And these children all together created one film, which is still being played around the world in festivals. What I love about this is the example of world-class artists enabling young people to experience art at the highest standard. Uh, this is an interesting project because it broke all the rules. And for me, I love it when you trust artists and they lead you into the most terrible trouble. The artist wanted a train to run on normal train lines, but to be a train for art, an African express, filled with these musicians, stopping all round the country and inviting the communities of the towns where they stopped to join them in classes and workshops and concerts. It broke all the rules, but we made it happen, and it was one of the great successes of the festival. By the way, in the middle, you can see Damon Albarn, one of the founders of Blur, also the founder of this collective of African musicians. Um, I'm going to leave my colleague Justine to talk about uh, this incredible commission, one of the greatest hits, so you can marvel at what has happened to Stonehenge, and she will explain later. She will also talk about these extraordinary commissions. By the way, those people are 400 metres above the ground on the London Eye. It was very important to us that we invited artists from all the countries in the world that participated in the Olympic Games, and also from artists for artists from countries that were not in the Olympic Games. So this is Daniel Barenboim with his remarkable West East Divan, which includes musicians from Palestine, not, not a participant in the Olympic Games, as well as from Israel, Lebanon, Syria, other countries in that region. And we had uh, artists from not only the countries in the world that cannot participate in the games, but actually artists who had no country. I think we were the first Olympics to invite the homeless people of our country to take part in the festival. And for many uh, previous Olympics, people with no homes who slept in the streets had been encouraged to leave town for the Olympics. We encouraged them to develop and share their musical skills in the Royal Opera House, in the grandest venue of our city. And this, I think, was a very important message of inclusion to send around the world. I, I won't talk about that, but it's Kate Blanchett, and I very much hope she wins the Oscar. Um, this is a final project where ordinary people worked with a great choreographer but I think that, for me, um, one of the key messages about the London 2012 Festival is that we used the program to speak to the world about who we thought we were as a country and what we wanted to say to the world was part of our program thinking. So we wanted to invite people to come to the country as tourists. We wanted people to see that we were not afraid of new work. We were a contemporary country. We were not just a country with a great heritage. We wanted people to celebrate diversity and to celebrate including all sorts of people, from Oscar winners to people with no homes. And those were the messages that we wanted to say. But for me, above all, the message was about how partnerships around the country of all sorts of local government, of tourist bodies, uh, with cultural organizations, could support artists to take risks and make once-in-a-lifetime work. It's a very crowded time, the Olympics, and the sport, of course, is thrilling. So the art needs to be just as thrilling. Uh, 
in the UK, our artists do great work in normal years. So for the London 2012 festival, it had to be really exceptional. I end as I start. That takes planning, and you are lucky that you have the time to plan a really exceptional festival. My last slide is about partnership, and it is always important to thank all of your partners, both the sponsors and the public sector partners who made the London 2012 Festival possible. I look forward to seeing how once in a lifetime becomes twice in a lifetime when we can share your great art in 2020. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. As Ruth said, it's an honor to be here. It's my first time in Japan, and I've been slightly overwhelmed by the welcome that we've received, and also by the enthusiasm that is already clearly evident for the Olympic Games. Um, and I very much hope that this is the start of a fruitful relationship between the United Kingdom and Japan, between London and Tokyo. I joined the Arts Council in England in 2005. It was just after London had been bombed, and it was just after London had won the bid to host the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. I think it was an interesting moment for my country. We had to think about who we wanted to be in the world, how we wanted to be seen, how we wanted to be understood. And actually, looking back, I think that moment in time had an enormous influence on the development of our cultural program for the Olympic Games. We wanted to be seen as open. We wanted to be seen as a safe country that welcomed visitors. And we wanted to think about how culture could be used as a connecting piece to tell stories and to share experiences. We've already heard that culture has been an integral part of the Olympic Games for some considerable time. This is a picture of Baron Pierre de Coubertin, who was the founder of the modern Olympic Games. And he believed that embedding culture into the Olympic movement was important. It says on the slide here that blending sport with culture and education, Olympism seeks to create a way of life based on the joy found in effort, the educational value of good example, and respect for universal fundamental ethical principles. I hope that's something that almost everybody in this room would feel comfortable in signing up for. As you've heard, um, Jude Kelly, who runs one of our major cultural institutions, the South Bank Centre, came to Tokyo to speak about how important culture was in writing a bid. And she was also involved right at the beginning um, in London in the bid process with representatives from my organisation, the Arts Council. They saw an opportunity to celebrate culture to advocate for the role of arts and culture in society. And they were very influential in raising the profile of culture at that particular moment. So we too had culture written into our bid document. We said we wanted a vibrant and rewarding Olympic Games and Paralympic Games. 
where the creativity of UK artists is enriched and inspires individuals and communities to fulfil their potential and achieve their best. And I think that theme of allowing space for professional artists to aim really high, as Ruth has talked about, and also allowing communities to fulfil their potential and be enriched by those artists was very important all the way through the planning and the delivery of the Olympic Games. And even back in 2004, there were key themes being talked about which realised themselves in 2012 in the finale of the cultural programme, the London 2012 Festival. We were talking about creativity and quality and innovation. We were talking about a desire to see London on show. Arts participation was important. And we were beginning, even back in 2004, to think about the legacy that we wanted to see post-Olympic Games. And as Ruth has said, there was something already beginning to emerge about the British identity in the 21st century. The mayor in London at the time talked about wanting to move London, no longer being seen as a city of bowler hats and fog and red buses to something more contemporary, more relevant when we're talking to the rest of the world. So the Arts Council in England is a little older than the Arts Council in Tokyo and we've been in existence for over 60 years. Over the four years of the current spending period we will have a budget of some £1.6 billion to spend on arts and culture. And our mission is to get great art to everyone across the country by championing, by developing and by investing in artistic experiences that enrich people's lives. You will see that there's a crossover between the Arts Council's mission and the themes that had emerged through the planning for the Olympic Games. And that's no accident, because the Arts Council staff were an integral part of the planning of the Games. So we were a principal funder of both the wider cultural programme and the London 2012 Festival. We saw London 2012 as an unprecedented, it truly is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to achieve our mission to bring great art to more people. And through our investment, we set out with three things that we wanted to achieve. The first was to increase participation in the arts in the country particularly amongst young people. And I'm really pleased to see in your thinking that same focus on young people. The second objective was to increase the profile for our artists, um, particularly recognising that the world would be looking at London in 2012, and also to continue to build public value for their work. And by that, I mean using the platform to consider and talk about why artists are important to our society and why they deserve investment. And the third objective was to strengthen our sector, the creative sector, by encouraging new partnerships and new collaborations. And the fact that you have Ruth here as the director of the festival and Justine from the mayor's office and me, we still smile, we're still talking to each other, is a really good example of that partnership in working. So I think one of the things that I would reflect on is that sometimes our interpretation, the Arts Council's interpretation, of how best we could achieve things was at odds with the London Organising Committee of the Olympic Games. I think that's natural. There are many different stakeholders who have an interest in delivering a really successful games for a country. And part of the challenge, and actually part of the excitement, if you're a strange kind of person like me, is enjoying those negotiations and working out how to bring everybody together. For us, it became much less of an issue after 2010 
when Ruth was appointed as artistic director. And one of our reflections in the time that we've been in Tokyo has been that you really do need to think about a cultural leader for your festival, one person who can bring everybody else together and create a sense of vision. This is just another slide to show our ambition. You can see that in 2006, our arts activity was at one level. By the time we got to 2008, with the Beijing handover, we were planning to start our cultural program, and we hoped that we would see a little spike in arts activity, which would build all the way through to 2012. And I thought, and this is my slide, that the activity would fall back down again after 2012, but the ambition was that it didn't fall back to the level of 2008 or 2006. In actual fact, part of the legacy of our work in the Olympics is that the arts participation has continued to grow. From 2011, it went up. In 2012, it went up. And in 2013, it went up, which is very encouraging for us as a, a funding body. So I was asked to include a timeline. And you can see, in 2004, we worked on the bid document. It contained a vision for the opening and closing ceremonies, the torch relay, for a network of big screens or live sites, which were a very successful bit of the overall program. And it had a vision for a four-year cultural program, which started at the end of the Beijing 28, 2008 Olympic Games. It built a huge sense of expectation in both the public and the arts sectors, I think. And the cultural sector wanted to know how to get involved. So under um, a guy called Bill Morris at LOCOG, the London Organising Committee of the Olympic Games, a series of consultation events were launched. And in 2007, um, we developed something called the Inspire Mark, which allowed community groups to begin to think about how their projects locally could become part of the Olympic Games. In 2008, we launched a four-year program. The INSPIRE program allowed organizations to carry the Inspired by 2012 mark. There were a series of open weekends that were planned and the bid projects were launched, those projects that had been in the bid document they included um, a project called uh, Stories of the World, which was a major museums project, Film Nation, a film project, um, a project that the Arts Council had launched, which gave major sums of money to artists across the regions to lead big community arts programmes, the World Shakespeare Festival, and, as Ruth has already talked about, Unlimited, the Festival of Deaf and Disabled Artists. And in 2009, the Arts Council in England also made a commissions fund available. And a number of the big commissions that finally went into the 2012 festival were enabled at that point. The challenge for us at this stage was that there was a proliferation of activity happening, but it wasn't sitting very clearly with one artistic vision. And in 2009, we created a cultural Olympiad board that sat underneath the London Organising Committee of the Olympic Games and I think was crucial in bringing focus to the cultural programme. Critically, the partners on that board included the major arts organisations, the BBC, the major funders, including the Arts Council. And you need all of those partners working together not creating their own separate festivals, but coming together. And the mayor's office were part of that consortia coming together. And there is a danger in other Olympic cities that you create a festival in the city and a festival in the country, and they fight each other for attention and for funding. I would really recommend that that's not something that you do, that you think about bringing things together.
Politically for us, it was very important that the games were not just seen to benefit London, but that the whole country could become involved. There were limited opportunities through the sports programme for that to happen, and the cultural programme became a really important connecting piece to connect across the country. Creative programmers were funded posts in each of the nine regions of England and in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, who became contact points for people who were interested in taking part in the cultural programme. I think those posts were useful for Ruth when she came into post because she had people on the ground who could help with the producing. But again, I think it's fair to say that until she came, they were independent individuals doing their own thing and there were questions about prioritisation and about the quality of the work that was being produced. So, as you've heard, Ruth was appointed in 2010 and when she arrived, she worked really hard to get all of the stakeholders to agree a common shared vision for the London 2012 Festival, the final year of the cultural programme. The vision was for a world-class cultural offering at the heart of the Games, and there were big targets. A UK-wide programme, which I've already talked about, so uh, a big programme that would attract new audiences, not just existing audiences for culture, and a target of 10 million free opportunities to attend. Ruth and her team way over succeeded on those targets, so... We thought they were tough at the time, but she did an amazing job. And internally, we were looking at 500,000 new cultural attendees, that their awareness of the cultural program would grow significantly, and that there would be a database at the end of the program that could be passed back to the cultural sector. As you've already been told, there are evaluation documents online and you can download those and have a look and all of these statistics are in those documents. The scale of achievement was really way and beyond what we'd expected. 200 new commissions, 160 world and UK premieres, over 18 million people took part in the, cult the wider cultural programme and 19.8 million people, or more than that slightly, in addition, took part in that festival year. So over 40 million people took part in the cultural festival. And as Ruth has already said, 80% of those attendances were free events, and that was an important part of the programme. The way the festival used media, I think, was really interesting, and maybe something you want to reflect on here. There were printed brochures, which is the traditional way of communicating a cultural festival. But there were also major media partners who published information. Email became a very, very important tool. And social media followers and Twitter became really, really interesting ways of capturing people's imagination, particularly because for some of the events, the security, the police and uh, the city authorities were worried about too many people coming. And so uh, publicity was released very late in the day so that events weren't swamped. And of course the website was important to both international visitors as well as UK visitors. This is just a slide to show you how the money came in a total of £126 million spent on the four-year programme. And you can see that the Arts Council was uh, the major funder in there, but that there were other funders as well. And uh, the diversity of funding has both strengths and weaknesses, which we can talk about in the um, questions and answer sessions if people would like to. And this is just a slide to show that the project, the cultural programme genuinely was national. So each of those segments represents a different region of the country. London is uh, the big section in uh, light grey or white, 
with um, uh, the national projects, projects that went right across the country in the darker grey. But every region is represented. Every region got really great quality projects um, that engaged lots of people locally. And again, another slide which just shows that we spent money on every type of art form. So visual arts and theatre were important. Dance and music were very popular. But literature projects are also in there. And the combined arts projects, the circus, the outdoor events and festivals are a major part of the programme. The legacy for the UK has been very interesting. There is a real hunger for large-scale, ambitious commissions now, not just in London, but in cities like Birmingham or Leeds, which were not traditionally perhaps cities that we'd been talking to in that way. There's also a real appetite for art in unusual places, you saw many of the pictures that Ruth showed and Justine will show more. Although people still go to theatres and galleries, there is a real interest in seeing work placed into different types of public space. Cultural tourism is a much bigger issue for the UK now than it was. Culture has always been a really successful sell for London, but again, the Arts Council is now funding a programme outside of London, working with our tourism agency Visit England, to help other cities realise their potential, not fighting against London, but in partnership with London. The free opportunities you've heard about, and that continues to be a big um, theme. The idea of p different cultural groups working together across art form was one that exploded during the Olympics and has continued in terms of the ideas that come to us for funding to be a big issue. Digital partnerships is something we haven't really talked about very much, but Ruth is now the artistic director of a project called The Space, which is a partnership between the BBC, our public funder, and the Arts Council, which is absolutely about exploring how artists can make new work in the digital sphere. You've heard about the deaf and disabled artists, well, we're continuing to fund that program because it's had such an enormous impact, not just on artists, but on the public as well. And there have been some extraordinary new partnerships created. We're working with the British Council in Brazil at the moment, in the run-up to 2016, on a major program of international exchange between artists in both countries. And they're learning a huge amount and having a fantastic time and perhaps that's something we should be thinking about for 2020. And we're also um, funding a creative employment programme post-Olympic Games in the UK. We're funding 6,500 opportunities for young people to come into our industry through paid internships and apprenticeships. It was a difficult economic climate for us in the UK as well as here in Japan. And we were worried that the diversity of our arts and cultural sector was becoming limited by those who could afford to come into the industry rather than those with most talent. And so we've continued that theme of supporting young people post-Olympic Games as well. So fantastic international artists were part of Ruth's programme. It wasn't just about opportunities for UK artists. And I think that's continued to be important to us, recognising that the influence of that cultural exchange helps drive ambition for everyone. Art in unusual places. We have some of our best pictures, but also we can all talk about personal experiences which really moved us when we saw some of this work. Those cultural tourism moments which pull big crowds into local cities and towns. The opportunity for people to be involved, not just to watch work, but actually to be part of the making of work, was really important. Our deaf and disabled artists are working in ways they never thought were possible. 
The diversity and multiculturalism of our city shone through during 2012 and continues to be part of the story post-2012. And that conversation about who we wanted to portray ourselves as is one that I think is very resonant here in Tokyo. And lastly, just to reflect on what Ruth reflected on as well. I think we are a country that's known for its heritage and people are attracted to the heritage of our country. But it became more and more important that we also had a contemporary feel. This is a piece of work by a poet called Carol Ann Duffy. And it's set and is a permanent piece in the Olympic Park. And she created work that reflected on the history of that area as it was being regenerated for the Olympic Park. And we found all sorts of different ways to bring the old and the new together and to create something different. And I think that's a very exciting possibility here as well. Finally, we, we were asked to share some thinking about learning with you. I think you now, as Ruth outlined, have the fantastic opportunity to think about what the end point will be for you. You don't have to decide at all, but you can have some sense of where you would like to get to, what the scale of the ambition might be. As I've stressed, it's really important to secure leadership within the cultural sector and within the OCOG for culture. If you try and fight against the people who are organising the games, I think you spend a lot of wasted time and effort. There are key moments of the games which you need to link into, and I think Justine might talk a bit about timing. One brand, not lots of different brands for culture, would be, in my view, a very good thing to think about. And somehow you need to work to create the flexibility to include venues who have non-Olympic sponsors as part of the story. All of your venues need to feel they can be included in some way, if at all possible. As Ruth said, we've come away from our visit, I think, really enthusiastic as you are, and very keen to work with you in whatever way is useful. And I wish you the very best of luck. I can't wait to see what you achieve in 2020. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, everyone, um, and thank you again to our hosts. Um, we've had an absolutely wonderful few days here in Tokyo. So I'm going to talk about culture and the host city um, from the perspective of London as the host city for the Olympic Games. I'm going to talk about what we did and particularly the obstacles that we faced because um, I think you can learn a lot more from the challenges um, than you can from presenting a rosy picture at the end. So um, when we hosted the Olympic Games, on the, the day of the opening ceremony, one billion people watched it on the television. Um, in America, there was 41 million people watched the opening ceremony, and that's the biggest audience there's been for a, a ceremony in an Olympic Games. So it's a major spotlight on your city uh, and on your nation and so while the spotlight was on us uh, we asked ourselves the question um, what do we want to tell the world and people don't come to London for the weather um, oh sorry I've just fallen down a hole I'll get my shoe later. <laughs> I'll do 
bit later, it's all right. <laughs> Um, we have a saying about the weather. We say that uh, culture is to London um, what the sun is to Spain. So you don't come to, cu- to London for the culture, for, this, for the weather. Um, in fact, when we poll people, when we ask visitors to London why they come, in fact, 80% say they come for culture, and whether that's to live, to work, or to visit. But that's changed. Over the last century or so, London was a very different place. It was, the focus was on the docks and on heavy industry. And we used to have the nickname, the Big Smoke, because the air was so polluted. But now London is a different place. Um, it's more about art, creativity, innovation, finance, retail, and heritage. So what was our vision as the host city for the Olympic Games? Well, a big part of our vision was that we wanted culture to be at the heart of the city and of the story that we told the world when that spotlight was on us. Our vision boiled down to six points. The first point, international position. As I mentioned, we wanted to use this global media moment to showcase our culture. Tourism. We wanted to enhance the visitor experience, so when people came to our city, we wanted them to have a good time. And also to uh, stop displacement, so we didn't want people to choose other destinations because the Games was on. We wanted the whole city to celebrate, and we didn't want the experience to be exclusively for ticket holders, because not everyone has a ticket. We wanted to tell some new stories. We wanted to tell, as Moira said, um, we wanted to refresh the image of the city. And we wanted people to look at our city in a different way. We wanted to think about ambition and quality. As Ruth said, it was a really a a once-in-a-lifetime moment. And we wanted to stage a really big free festival. And finally, we wanted it to be a unified festival, one festival with one curator, led by an artistic director, not by the government or the host city government or the games organisers. We looked around the world and no great festival has ever been run by a committee and we didn't want to make that mistake. So running a festival as part of... uh, the Olympic Games, is quite a complicated effort. It's more complicated than usual. There's lots of other things to consider that normally you wouldn't have to think about running a festival. So there were some obstacles. Um, So I'm going to quickly run through some of the obstacles. As I said, I think they are often the more interesting things to consider. So I mentioned tourism. One of our major national newspapers, four years before the Games, had a headline. It read, The Olympics are the kiss of death for um, for tourism. London is one of the most visited cities in the world, actually. About 15 million visitors come to London every year. So, and when you host an Olympic Games, Often people don't visit your city for various reasons. Um, They think it would be too expensive, it's very difficult to get hotels. um, And so you often lose a lot of tourism when you host an Olympic Games. So for us that was a very big concern because we're very reliant on tourists because we get 15 million. If lots of those people choose to go elsewhere, then we will take a big economic hit. And that's a picture of some tourists going to New York instead. So our questions were, how can we stop people from going elsewhere? And then also, how can we get them to come back if they do go elsewhere once the Games is over? Another challenge was money. There's never enough enough of it. Um, We didn't start with a budget. 
which I wouldn't recommend. So we did look for creative solutions with regard to the money. Um, for example, um, when you host the Olympic Games, there's always a budget for city dressing, so flags, uh, marketing. And uh, we made the argument that we could better use that money by focusing it on culture. Um, and using culture to animate and bring to life the city would actually have more impact than rows and rows of flags. Another obstacle was the complexity um, that you have to deal with when you host Olympic Games. A really complicated big partnership. Everyone has to work together in a new way. It forces people to form new partnerships. So producing a cultural festival involved the police, the transport agencies, sponsors, politicians, the media, and of course, artists and everyone had to work together. Another concern of ours was infrastructure. That's the London Metro, and it's uh, the oldest metro in the world. It's 150 years old, so we were worried about the capacity and the ability of our transport system to cope. We also looked at previous games. As Moira said, often uh, through the history of the games, you see um, a host city developing a cultural festival and the organising committee of the Olympic Games organising a festival. So you have two festivals, two marketing plans, two programmes, two festival teams, and these festivals compete against each other. And we wanted to avoid competing festivals. So we built one team and one festival. And that's Ruth and I, one team. So then we made our teams, we amalgamated our teams into one team. So thinking about this question of how to tell the story of the city when the main focus is sport. Here's some pictures of um, the 100 metres in Barcelona, in Atlanta and Sydney. And of course, what you notice there is they all look the same. So we looked to culture to try and tell our story. And I'll just talk through a few of the storytelling projects. So this is a company um, from New York, Elizabeth Streb, known as the Evil Knievel of Contemporary Dance. And uh, her company created choreography um, that animated the architecture of the city. So lots of the architecture in London is very familiar. The London Eye that Ruth showed. This is Millennium Bridge. There you can see Tower Bridge. And this is the Mayor's Office, City Hall. My office is just on the top right-hand corner. Um, and Elizabeth Streb um, created bespoke choreography for all of those iconic architectural structures and buildings. So, and what that enabled us to do was refresh the story around the world. And we, these pictures appeared on front pages of every major national newspaper and went around the world internationally. So as well as being a fantastic opportunity for an international artist, this project worked very hard for us as a city because it equally it marketed the city and it showcased the city in a fresh way. Another very different project, but thinking about the, the same idea of storytelling, fresh storytelling, was this project. It was called Hat Walk. And um, one of the things about London is there's hundreds and hundreds of monuments and statues all over the city. And mostly you don't notice them. They disappear. They become the wallpaper of the city. And so as a surprise, we commissioned lots of our contemporary milliners to make bespoke hats for the statues. Um, and so at the beginning of the games, everyone awoke to see the statues with special hats. And this project was interesting because it brought together heritage and contemporary culture. And critically, it gave us fantastic photographs as well. So 
This was the most downloaded picture. All these pictures were the most downloaded from the Olympic Media Centre around culture. Another project was uh, called Piccadilly Circus Circus. Piccadilly Circus is in the centre of London, uh, an important and well-known landmark. And uh, so we put a real circus in it. And to do that, we had to close down the whole of central London for the first time since 1945, which during the Olympic Games was quite challenging um, because traffic management, as you'll come to realise, becomes a critical issue. But it was a very special moment because um, we, we handed over the city to the people um, purely for the joy of it. And the piece concluded with the dropping of 1,500, uh, one and a half tons of feathers from the sky over the people. So normally this is a big transport route and then it was handed over to the people. Again, it was a surprise project, it just happened. Another one of our programmes was participation. One of the things about hosting the Olympic Games is that the tickets are very hard to buy, and even if you, um, even if you have the money, and for a lot of people they're too expensive to buy. So we wanted to use the cultural programme to create an opportunity for everyone to feel part of that celebration. And this is a dance project called The Big Dance. Five million people took part in it. It happened all over the UK and in 23 countries. And this is thousands of people in our main square, Trafalgar Square. And it really gave a sense that everyone was working together in this collective moment of creativity. I talked at the beginning about um, telling fresh stories, different stories. Um, so we wanted to not just talk about the Tower of London that people are very familiar with, but hidden London. So we commissioned a project with the Royal Opera House that happened in canals. Lots of people don't know that there is a canal network all around in uh, London. And equally, people don't tend to know that there's outdoor swimming pools in London. So we commissioned a ballet in our Lidos, our outdoor pools. A recurring theme for all of us and over these last few days has been young people. And uh, we, had a, we held a big music competition called Gigs. And uh, all of our young people competed to win this competition. And they did so by playing for thousands of hours all around the streets of, the, of London during the games, entertaining visitors. And it really transformed the atmosphere of the city. We had... Uh, fantastic actors popping up in the city, performing Shakespeare. And the festival ran across the whole of the city, so not just in the central zone and not just in the Olympic venues, across all the boroughs of the city. We had 200 artists and there were over 5,000 events, so it was the most ambitious festival we'd staged in London. And it was all free, all the mayors projects were free. Just a quick point on timing. Um, one of the things we thought about was that, as I said, the main show in town is the sport. So rather than trying to compete with the sport, we try to wrap ourselves around the sport and complement the sport with the cultural programme. So we focused the programme before the Games kicked off in the in-between period, which is about two weeks in between the Olympics and the Paralympics, and as the kind of finale moment. One of the things about the pre-games period is that thousands of journalists come into your city to prepare for the reporting of the Olympic Games. But there is no Olympic Games in that period, so they tend to report on the problems. So we put a lot of our cultural activity in that 10-day period, so there was lots of good and positive celebratory stories happening for the press. The communication side is very interesting. Um, we learned that there's two types of media. There's accredited media, 
we had 20,000 accredited media from all around the world in the Olympic Park. And there, the one, each nation has a one broadcaster that can cover the games. And then there's the non-accredited media, the people who don't have the license to cover the games, but they come anyway. And we had 9,000 of those non-accredited media. And they are a very interesting group of media because they're not covering the sport. So it's a fantastic opportunity to tell the story of the city, whatever that story is. So we focused a lot of our cultural communications on the non-accredited media. So finally, legacy. Um, we didn't take um, the big hit on tourism that we expected. Um, we did experience what is known as the Olympic bounce. So visitors increased the year after to 17 million. That's an increase over that summer period of 12%. 90% of Londoners said their perceptions of London had improved. We improved our uh, international reputation. This didn't always happen in a planned fashion. This is our mayor, who accidentally got stuck on a zip wire. But our brand index did improve. The brand index is the international study of the perception of your city um, as a brand. And culture went from fifth in the world to fourth. And the welcome, how welcoming your city is, uh, we went from 12th to 9th. Um, and it's very hard, I understand, to shift your city up the brand index. Normally you move because of major events like a war or a natural disaster. Um, more legacy um, this is the project that Ruth mentioned um, it's an exact replica of Stonehenge as a bouncy castle Stonehenge is a really famous monument in the UK and uh, it was fantastically popular and it's now gone on an international tour and uh, a quarter of a million people have bounced on it this is a good example I think of uh, how some of the most brilliant projects emerged through an, an open and ambitious question that Ruth put to artists and you know, we asked Jeremy Della, the artist here what is it that you've always wanted to do and have never been able to do and he said I'd like to make a bouncy castle Stonehenge we would have never imagined that ourselves we thought he was crazy So that's it for me, just to say that it's been a great privilege um, to be here with you over these last few days and to be at the start of your journey. And we're absolutely confident that you're going to take what we've done and surpass it and put on the best uh, cultural Olympiad ever. I'm just finally going to show you a very short video that um, encapsulates some of the projects we did in London. Um, and the music is written and performed by the winner of our street busking competition. Thanks very much. I've got a pretty little songbook She only ever sings for me Seen her outside my window Just sitting in the apple tree I took a wander to the river Now down to the river that's deep and wide Saw all the fish that are swimming, Lord Made me want to jump inside I've been walking in the city Walking walk on the bridges Look thorn down into the river Jump, jump, jump into the water Down, down, down beneath the surface You gotta wanna, I wanna survive Heard the sound this morning Sound like a hammer falling City, walking on the bridges, looked on down into the river, 
jump, jump, jump to the water. Down, down, down beneath the surface. You gotta wanna, I wanna survive. Heard the sound this morning, early in the morning. Heard the sound this morning, tip at the morning. Heard the sound this morning, sound like a hammer falling. Early in the morning